Hi everyone, welcome to Legal Talk. I'm your host, Stacy Clark. Have you ever invented something or maybe you've written your first book or your first symphony? How do you protect this property of yours that you worked on for maybe years from being stolen by others? Well, our guest today will answer this question and more. Stephen Murray is a patent attorney that has been successfully protecting his client's intellectual property and more for over 15 years. He's recognized by his peers as one of the top lawyers in his field in the two best lawyers in America and has been so for the last four years. A partner in one of the region's top copyright, trademark, and patent law firms located here in Philadelphia, Steve is a favorite of clients for his incredible command of the law, his work ethic, and I'll vouch for this, great personality. He has leadership positions within his firm and serves on the board of the Eastern Montgomery County Chamber of Commerce and as its co-chair of the Technology Committee. Steve hosts his own web series, which you have to see, as his alter ego, Dr. IP, on YouTube, where he explains the basics of intellectual property law with lots of wacky humor. You have to check it out. He has fans in corporate America as well as in my home. So without further ado, welcome, Stephen. Let's get right to it. I just said that you were one of the country's top intellectual property lawyers. Can you tell me what the term intellectual property means and why we need to protect it? Intellectual property is uh, basically centered around protection and dissemination of ideas. Mm -hmm. um, what the law tries to do is protect what comes out of here, the same as we would protect personal property or real estate. Uh, someone is not permitted to come into your home and take something there and start using it willy-nilly. Um, and we want the same to happen for ideas as well. And there can be substantial sums of uh, money involved in this as well, because you have uh, infringement lawsuits ending in eight or nine figure um, verdicts or settlements. Those are extreme cases, obviously, but sure. uh, you know the ask in infringement suits can be six figures, um, on, you know, on average. Uh, and just so you don't think it's limited to kind of big corporations suing over this kind of money, uh, if people remember Napster from 20 years ago. Uh, it was a file sharing service where people were exchanging songs on the internet. Um, lawsuits coming out of that were targeting individuals for six figures, you know, two hundred fifty thousand dollars or something along that line. Uh, but it's not it's not all about infringement either. Um, one of our firm's biggest success stories uh, has to do with the Super Soaker. The which Super Soaker. I we, remember. We, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so w we obtained a couple patents uh, for the inventor. Not me. I was, full disclosure, I was a consumer of the Super Soaker oh, at the time. I was. Detail. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> um, but so the, the, the gentleman who invented the Super Soaker is a brilliant guy named Lonnie Johnson. Um, he was working at NASA at the time, I believe. Hmm. Uh, so this was not part of his employment. This was, you know, he kind of came up with this on his own. It, was, it takes a rocket scientist, of course, to <laughs> develop a, a new type of squirt gun. Uh, uh -huh. But so he, he developed the, the super soaker, got some patents on it, and then he uh, made a deal with Laramie, the toy company, to distribute and sell the super soaker, and he, he made a ton of money. Um, that's, that's something we all aspire to. That's a, an exceptional instance of it but uh, when you have an idea it can come to fruition and it can mean significant money for you um, mm. but the bottom line is the law gives you two options essentially you either protect it or you share it so you have to take a step here you can't be passive correct to protect your intellectual property this the script the book the symphony so what kinds of options do people have under the law to protect their intellectual property? So there are basically four different types of intellectual property law that are the main. Mm -hmm. um, and they each protect something different. So it's not like you really have a choice, so I'm, I'm going to get a patent or a trademark on this. It's usually dictated by uh, the idea, the nature of the idea itself. Uh, so the first one would be patents. Patents is where I do most of my work uh, in day in and day out. 
Uh, patents are for inventions. So it's a machine, a process. I like to say things that you use, um, televisions, uh, toasters, other things that begin with T. Um, <laughs> yeah. What a patent does is you file a patent application. It goes to the patent office. It gets examined, and then the examiner will tell you whether you not you meet the qualifications to obtain a granted patent. And then once you have a granted patent, you then have, it's about 17 years, mm. over which no one is permitted to use what is in your patent without your permission or without compensating you. After the patent expires, it's then free for everyone to use. That's sort of the public trade-off for getting this sort of uh, legal monopoly as it is. Uh, but for that 17 years where you're protected, no one can practice without your permission. Mm. You have control over who uses the invention. Okay. And just to dispel a common misunderstanding with patents, you don't have to be Thomas Edison. You don't have to invent the light bulb mm -hmm. to get a patent. Uh, as long as you meet the requirements and it's just some sort of innovation, uh, you, it can be an improvement, a minor improvement on something that already exists. And really? you can get patent protection. I've done a lot of work uh, in my uh, experience in the medical device field, and you would not believe how many patents are directed to just a little device that's supposed to cover the tip, the sharp tip of the needle to prevent you from sticking yourself. There are hundreds, hundreds. if not thousands of patents on things like that. Wow. Um, the second type of protection is trademarks. Mm -hmm. Those are for things like logos, uh, names, uh, branding is a good way to describe it. So what trademarks are for is to uh, help you distinguish your product or your service from similar of others. Mm -hmm. And the example I like to give, uh, there was a commercial I haven't seen in a while, but uh, there was a, it was for Band-Aids. And you had a kid saying, I am stuck on Band-Aid brand because Band-Aid stuck on me. Right. Well, why does he sing about Band-Aid brand? Well, Band-Aid is not the actual name for the thing that you stick on your arm after you get a shot. Uh, it's, a, it's just an adhesive bandage. Band-Aid is a brand name trademarked by Johnson & Johnson uh, to try and distinguish their adhesive bandages from others. So if you walk into a CVS and you buy a CVS brand adhesive bandage, the box will not say Band-Aid. Mm -hmm. Johnson & Johnson is hoping that the use of Band-Aid will give the consumer some idea of quality um, to, to kind of give them a leg up on the competition. Sure. The third type of protection is copyrights. And these are fun because um, whether people know it or not, I think most people actually own a copyright. Uh, copyrights are for artistic works, and it's not just you know things on the wall. Uh, art can encompass literature, so books, symphonies, novels, um, uh, music, videos, sculptures, anything. It, I, I like I think to say it, expression mm. is is what you're looking at. Um, so if anyone's ever drawn an original uh, doodle in grade school or something they probably have a copyright. Really? Uh, once you take the artistic idea from up here uh -huh. and fix it to something tangible, like on a piece of paper, a block of marble, a videotape, if they still exist, um, the copyright attaches automatically. So you automatically have a copyright. The rub is, in order to enforce that copyright, to get into court, uh -huh. you have to register that copyright with the U.S. Copyright Office. Okay. So That's the trick. It's Again, you have to do something. You're not automatically protected. That's right. And yeah. that's, a, that's a relatively simple process. We counsel clients on how to do it. I've actually done it myself. I had a drawing that uh, I was putting onto t-shirts I was distributing to friends and family. And I thought, well, this is finally getting out in the world. Maybe I ought to register it. And I registered it, and it was a simple process, and now I've got a copyright registration in my house, which is really cool. I'd like to buy one of those t-shirts, please. <laughs> <laughs> and then the, the, the final one um, is trade secrets. And this is, so like Coca-Cola, the recipe for Coke is, a, is considered a trade secret. The 11 herbs and spices at KFC. Uh, doing research for one of my web shows, Idea Defense 101, I learned that the filling for a Twinkie is actually a trade secret, believe the it or not. The filling for a Twinkie yes. is a trade secret. Okay. That's right. A very delicious trade secret. <laughs> um, but so trade secrets are considered as sort of an alternative to patents. 
Uh, the benefit you have over a patent is that there's no expiration, a set expiration period. So mm -hmm. under the right set of circumstances, the trade secret could last indefinitely. Mm. Um, but the, the disadvantage with patents is you get a lot narrower protection. Um, with a trade secret, the only way to enforce it is you're going to have to prove that somebody unlawfully took it from you. Okay, well, let's talk about that. What happens if you don't go hire an attorney and get patent protection on an invention? What could happen? So I said earlier, you, you have two options. One is protect it, one is share it. Yeah. And when I say share it, I mean for free. Uh, because if you give somebody your idea without any sort of protection on it, they are free to use it in whatever way they wish without having to owe you a, a penny. Oh no. Yeah. Um, the, so the, what the, the, the trouble clients come to us with, usually in this circumstance, is they have an idea and they want to pitch it to somebody, an investor, uh, a manufacturer, they need somebody to mass produce it, right. um, things of that nature. And they come into us and they say, well, how do I go in there and show them my idea mm -hmm. without them then showing me the door and then taking my idea and running with it uh, the other direction? And if you don't have protection, that is what can happen. Overseas manufacturing is a big problem uh, with this kind of thing because uh, you'll, you'll go to a, a manufacturer, they'll manufacture it for you, but now they know how to do it. And so now they're going to manufacture it for 10 other people mm -hmm. if you don't have protection and they're competing with you with knockoffs in those circumstances. So it's, it's very important to get protection before you ever uh, approach somebody or discuss an idea with them. Mm -hmm. So as, as you say, there are unscrupulous actors out there waiting to pounce on other people's ideas and profit from them. Right. And without legal recourse, there's nothing you can do to stop them. So how do you protect yourself? I know this is not the kind of thing where you go to a bookstore and get Protect Myself 101. This is a complicated technical area. People should not try it at home by themselves and do something over the Internet. So tell us what's involved in protecting ourselves. So the, the first thing we tell any client when they go to somebody where they're going to share their idea, at a bare minimum, what you want to do is get a non-disclosure agreement. Mm -hmm. That is a contract that you sign with the other party. You say, I'm going to share my idea with you. You are to keep it secret. Uh, you are not to use it for any purpose other than what we are talking here to talk about. Uh, and so if they go and they breach that, then you have a contract case mm -hmm. uh, at, at least. So that's the bare minimum you want going into one of these meetings. Okay. Um, the trouble with those is they tend to have expiration dates. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, you only have to keep it secret for five years, maybe. After that, you're free to do with it what you want. Oh. Uh, so the next step we advise inventors to do is to file a what's called a provisional patent application. Ah, I see. A provisional patent application is different than a, a regular application, which is what turns into a patent in the end. A provisional, we kind of like to see it as a, it's like a stake in the ground. Mm. Uh, it gets you a filing date and you can say, after this date, nothing that comes after me can be used against me in determining whether I deserve a patent. But more importantly for the inventor, what it does is it gives you a modicum of protection. You can discuss what's in that application with people and it gives you a year to figure out is it worthwhile for me to file a regular application and go for a patent? Because it's, not, a, it's mm -hmm. not an inexpensive process. But you get a year to determine, hey, this seems like it's going to have a market. I might make some money off this. Filing a patent to keep the protection makes sense. Or, you know, this really isn't catching on with anybody. It's not yeah. going anywhere. I'll just let it go. Yeah. Provisionals are, are, are cheap ways to, to start the process and give yourself some time to figure it out. So... I don't want to be infringing on anyone's ideas or property. How can I avoid doing that even innocently? Um, it's, there's no 100% guarantee mm. to avoid it. Uh, obviously, if you're going to do something uh, extremely unlawful, you know, direct copying, obviously avoid that yes, <laughs> when I'm, possible. Hopefully your viewers are, are for sure. <laughs> not of that ilk. but. Um, uh, a lot of times what clients have us do is we do what are called clearance searches. 
Hmm. Uh, we will go out and we will look for, you know, if it's an invention, we'll look for patents. If it's a trademark, we'll look for trademarks that are in the same area uh, and could potentially cause overlapping issues. Uh, we, we, in some cases, we do a full, we just go for the landscape, just look at everything we can. Sometimes it's more targeted. We get, uh, you know, I have X competitor in my field. Uh, just look for patents from them. So we'll go and then we'll look at the patents we find. Sense. Yeah, we'll look at the patents we find and we a lot of patents and trademarks, but patents especially is interpretation. Uh, so we have to go look at the patents and determine, OK, what you're doing seems like it's OK or you might have a problem. Let's talk about maybe ways to avoid it. And the most important time to do this is before you release your product or your new branding or whatever to the public, because that's always the time where it's easier to fix if there's a problem found, right? You don't wanna be after the fact. We had a client who uh, didn't do a search, put a new product out, was sued for patent infringement, and took it all the way to trial and the verdict came back over a million dollars. Wow. That client now, every time they release a new product, uh, an improvement, they are, doing a search to make sure they do everything they can. It's it's not a 100% guarantee. As I said, it's it's a lot of interpretation involved. Right. Uh, and sometimes you can't know how a patent owner is going to read what their patent says. It, it might have been originally directed to an invention that they had, but now there's something else that's sort of like it. And maybe the patent can read on that, and it's hard to anticipate how they're going to do it. Uh, but this this is one way you can uh, to to make sure that you are doing everything you can to avoid it. So, does it take a long time to get a patent? Ah, uh, it can. <laughs> uh, one thing inventors should be advised is be patient. Um, the the examination process is you file your application, and then there's a patent examiner who will look to see that your application, your invention, meet all the criteria that are necessary to be a, awarded a patent. Um, and they will communicate that with you or your, your attorney. Right. Um, and so they'll say, your application, your invention has these problems, this, this existed before, there's something wrong with this. And then you have a chance to remedy it. You either say, examiner, you're wrong, or okay, I'll fix that, and you, and you fix it. And that can be iterative and happen multiple times. Ah. Uh, I had a client, I believe he was still in college when he first came to us. Uh, he, w he wanted a patent application on his senior project, which was really cool, um, light therapy eyeglasses. So they were eyeglasses you could wear that would give you kind of light therapy without having to, and previously you had to sit in these boxes for, you know, 15, 20 minutes or oh. whatever it is and get light into your eyes. It's like for, for addressing depression and other things oh. that like the, the seasonal, seasonal disorder. Di yeah. Uh -huh. That's it, the seasonal disorder. Yeah. So you get, you get light that's like sunlight coming in directly into your eyes. Huh. Um, so we filed his patent application and it actually took four rounds with the examiner before the examiner was finally satisfied that yes, you, you are entitled to a patent. Um, so, you know, it, four different times the examiner came to us, so we had to go back and back and forth. So it can take a while. Sometimes you get lucky. Right. You get it the first time around. Right. But more often than not, you get at least one rejection, and sometimes it can go on. It's a, it's, it can be a matter of years, unfortunately. But, you know, he, now he's got his patent. It's a great thing on his that. resume. Yeah, 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 yeah. He's got his patent. Okay, let's talk about the other side of the coin. When someone accuses you of stealing their ideas, how does that happen? Walk us through that and how we can protect ourselves in that case. Or well, what, what do we face? Well, you brought up innocent infringement before. Uh, yeah. That's usually what you're looking at in patents and trademarks. Um, you, you don't have to know that something is patented or that something is trademarked in order to be found liable. Um, the consequences, there are two usual consequences. The first is the court uh, may issue what's called an injunction, which is basically the court says you no longer can sell that product. Uh, you can no longer use that name, that logo, uh, which in some instances is, you know, it's, it's fine, it's easy enough to drop. But in some instances, you know, that could be part of your whole business. Uh, it could be consequential if you can no longer do it. Yeah. Uh, it, particularly in the patent realm, those are much more difficult to get these days just because of the way the case law is developed. So the second consequence and most more likely is uh, damages, money. Yeah. Okay. Um, you know, if if you 
if you had a patent on a chair or if someone else had a patent on a chair and I come out and I start selling a chair that even though I've come up with it on my own, incorporates something that came from that chair patent, even if I didn't know about it, um, a patent owner is entitled to no less than a reasonable royalty, which is just some amount that a court determines or is decided in settlement that uh, all right, you're going to pay a percentage of your sales. You're going to have some lump sum or some yeah. yearly uh, total, uh, and that's that's a real consequence that can happen. Is you're going to owe somebody some money. So to avoid that, we advise you know doing clearance searches or just looking around and making sure before you release it. Right. Um, is is the best way to try and avoid that. Well. I know, you know I'm a fan of Dr. IP. Tell me about your webcast, how it came to be, and what are you trying to do with it, and why folks should tune into it. Dr. IP. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, the, that whole thing came about, um, I wanted to educate people. A lot of the stuff we're talking about is today is very complicated. Yeah, it is. Uh, and, but there are a lot of simple concepts that it's helpful for people to know before they ever step into an attorney's office to, to get help in these regards. I mean, I can't tell you the number of times somebody comes to us with an invention and they say, ah, oh, yeah, I need a trademark for this. Well, maybe you'll need a trademark for the name, but the invention requires a patent. And so part of the idea was to, to kind of help people understand, all right, well, what are patents for? What are trademarks for? What are the things you have to look out for? What does patent infringement do? What do you yeah. need for patentability? But I wanted to do it in a way that would be helpful to remember because I feel like when you have somebody just sitting at a table giving you a dry lecture, it's not gonna stick. And I, I thought if I injected some humor into it, if I gave good examples with some, with, you know, get some laughs behind it, it would be easier to remember. And that's one of the things I've found is people will come to me and say, wow, that episode was really funny. But then the next thing out of their mouth is, I had no idea that uh, the shape of something could be a trademark. And that shows me the, the education stuck. Yeah, which is the the end goal. They you know, enjoyed it and learned from it. It's great to be it's great to be fun and entertaining, but I I wanted it to be informative, and they're getting both out of it, which is which has been great. Okay, so Doctor IP is something you continue to do. You've yes. just finished the first season, can we say? I actually, a, as of now, the second season is is rolling out. Oh, uh, so. and, and where can people see Doctor IP? So the easiest way to get there um, would be to go to our firm's website, uh, panichlaw.com. P A N I T C H Law. Uh, Panich, how to spell Panich, yeah. And um, you go to my bio and there is a link there that will take you to my YouTube uh, okay. channel yeah. where all the episodes are provided. Okay, great. Well, um, this has been so informative. I just have a few more questions for you. Has COVID affected anything in the intellectual property world with courts being not able to look at things or litigate or patents? Litigation and, and work at the patent office has been fairly, has continued to be uh, fairly consistent. Um, we're just doing things remotely nowadays, as yeah. a lot of people are. Yeah. So court hearings are on Zoom or uh, Teams, and the same thing with the patent office. Uh, the, the interesting thing that's kind of come out of this is, um, you know, at the start of the pandemic, we had a lot of people come in with COVID-related inventions. Uh, so, you know, things for disinfecting or oh, social distancing, people whose, whose business is entirely separate from anything like that. Uh, and then as, as time went on, you, you got less of those applications and some people just, you decided it wasn't going to go anywhere and dropped it. But some people, some clients, the idea morphed into something different, you know, so we had one client who, who came to us with an idea for, uh, an apparatus for disinfecting surfaces. And a year later, we go to convert the application. Hey, this has usefulness for what we actually do in our business. <laughs> we can use this to move things around. It's, it's you know, interesting. So it's, it's, it's fascinating to see how that developed. You know, it all started COVID, COVID, COVID. And now it's like, well, this has other uses besides that as well. So that's Lucky person, lucky yeah. client. Yeah. For sure. Well, what would be the two most important things you'd like our audience to go away with? The first I would say is always be careful and protective um, when you're discussing your inventions. It's easy to go to a cocktail party and brag to your friends about what you've been working on in your garage. Uh -huh. uh, but 
you know, you, you say the wrong thing to the wrong person, the next thing you know, you're watching your product get sold and there's not anything you can do about it. Um, so always just be very careful. Don't talk about it unless you've got protections in place, a non-disclosure agreement at minimum, a patent application, a trademark application, something out there to protect you. And then the second is, uh, this is a very, very complex specialized field. <laughs> yes. Um, so you always want to consult an attorney. This is, as you said earlier, this is not something you go and you just fill out a, a standard form and submit, um, particularly on the patent side. Uh, you want someone who understands the, the law because that's very nuanced and someone who understands the technology, particularly on the patent side, again. Mm -hmm. um, your, the, your attorney who drafted your will is not someone usually who can help you with this. And, and you know, any competent attorney will tell you, I, I certainly am not comfortable, uh, you know, going out and trying to fill out an immigration form. Right. Uh, and certainly an immigration attorney is most likely to tell you, yeah, that's not really something I should be handling and will refer you to right. the right the right person. But it's important you consult the right type of attorney in these types of matters. Right, and there are people like you who can actually use the word specialize in intellectual property because it is such a specialized area. So if folks wanted to get in touch with you, what would be the best way? Uh, so again, you could um, go to our firm's website, panishlaw.com. Uh, my bio has links to my email. Um, you can hit me up if you get to my YouTube channel. You'd certainly like, subscribe, comment. Uh, I'm responsive to comments when they come out. Uh -huh. um, you know, uh, social media, you can follow me there. Links are available uh, at the YouTube and on the firm. We're gonna show on the screen right now your email address. So if you have questions about anything, I'm sure Steve would more than be happy to talk to you for a few minutes about them. Um, or go to Dr. IP and see if your questions are answered there. Uh, there's a lot of great advice in this area, but I think what we've learned today is you have to take action to protect your stuff and your stuff is what is under that great term of intellectual property so if you have any ideas for other shows that you'd like us to have educational topics in the law that you would like to see gone over i'm happy to have that input you can always reach me at stacy at stacyclarkmarketing.com or through the station right here so until next time, thank you very much for watching. Good luck with all your inventions.